Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome in to another episode of The Buddhist Biohacker. This is our 149th episode in 2020. If you guys can believe it, we have just done amazing things, and that doesn't even include all of the incredible summits we did this year, and we're in the final two shows of the year, which I cannot believe, and I am so honored to have our guests with us today. Um, we are live with Clark Strand and Perdita Finn, authors of The Way of the Rose. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hey, everybody. <laughs> yeah. And we're also here with April Meganson, whom we love so much. She's been on several times this year. So welcome back, April. Thank you so much. And we do have Pari Award waiting in the wings with some technical issues. So um, we'll be sharing some of her comments. And, you know, yeah. Clark and Perdita, you guys came on right at the beginning of, of the Buddhist biohacker journey, really. And I had such an, a profound experience with Mother Mary and found your book, The Way of the Rose. And I have to be honest, we have had some incredible comments and emails from people so excited for the show today. We are so excited to have you here. We're right. so happy to be back. We sure are. Thanks for having Especially us. Especially in the very beginning of Advent. It feels very, the Advent and the full moon, this feels like a, an you eclipse. Know, and an eclipse. I mean, we, we we kept rescheduling and we landed right here, which is the late way the lady works. She yeah. she orchestrates our dance moves, we find. <laughs> yes, what an auspicious occasion. And Taria was so kind to gift me with your new book, Now is the oh. Hour of Her Return. And uh -huh. oh my God, I'm a Scorpio woman. So these Kali poems are like, oh my God, I can't even, I have a few marked to share today. They're just absolutely beautiful and incredible. So I can't wait to share, but I do want to start out for anyone who's new to the community. We've actually grown from zero to 2,300 subscribers this year. Um, we have so many new people and I know we have a lot of people excited, but I do want to have you just share a little bit about who you are and what you do and, and what this is all about. <laughs> we, <laughs> right. question, I know oh, it is. It is. You go um, first. <laughs> um, we are married. We've been married for almost 30 years. Um, we live together in the Catskill Mountains. And we are both uh, refugees from any number of spiritual groups and communities. Mm -hmm. And we began asking a long time ago, about 25 years ago, what was the spiritual response to climate change? And we were reading a lot of the climate reports early, early on. And we we're great deep lovers of nature and this feeling of dread and, and what do we do with it? And in the midst of that journey, uh, there were many things we learned and, uh, but it was all kind of blown apart when nine years ago, Clark experienced an apparition of, of, a, of a woman we call the lady. Mary is one of her names. She has many names. Kali is another. Our Lady of Guadalupe and Tanantzin is another. And she has so many names because she, she revels in multiplicity like nature does. There's not one kind of butterfly or is there one kind of lady. So we've been on this journey. I mean, in terms of biography, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I grew up in the Bible Belt, <laughs> left it as soon as I could and went off, uh, you know, came came north to New York and uh, entered a Zen Buddhist monastery, ultimately became a monk and then a teacher and then uh, left that, went to Tricycle the Buddhist Review, where I, where I was the uh, first senior editor during the 90s. And then uh, right about that time, we started writing our own books and we we're having uh, our second kid, so we bailed on that Manhattan sort of magazine life and, you know, Columbia University life, and, and we moved to Woodstock, New York, where we've lived ever since. Uh, the apparitions blindsided me completely. I I was, I described myself as a professional patriarch, <laughs> meaning that <laughs> I studied complete, blissfully unaware of any alternative. I studied every imaginable patriarchal spiritual tradition. And, you know, when the apparitions began, I had literally one book in my massive library of, of spiritual texts on the divine feminine. And I didn't even know it was about the divine feminine. <laughs> It was the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Our daughter jokes <laughs> that, that, that if Our Lady can save him, she can save anyone. 
reform. <laughs> I think the word she used is reform. There's something like that. But in truth, <laughs> I was but, not a good candidate. <laughs> but as his wife, as his wife, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna uh, disparage him quite so much because what Clark has two things and two factors, and there's a reason I chose him too, which is his love of nature is profound. And you know, the first thing I, I think our second date, we left New York City and went into the mountains and stayed out in the woods until it was deep at night. And he's, you know, and he would leave me haiku poetry and nature poetry all around the house when we were first dating. And he used to always say, "How come in our culture people know the names of celebrities and their children and their love affairs, and they can't name their trees in their yard?" Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so Clark could name the trees in our yard and he mm. could name the birds and his relationship to the lady wasn't as a spiritual idea. It was through the body of the earth. Yeah. About uh, for, for me, a kind of a watershed moment came. Uh, I was part of a think tank back in the, uh, for the Washington post uh, Newsweek. They had this thing called on faith blog and they got a lot of people together. I think I'd published a, a, a sort of a Buddhist koan type approach to the Bible. And I think that's how I got on the team. But they assembled a lot of people together and they posed sort of difficult or interesting questions. And that was the point at which I began to really, really wonder, you know, like what what is the value of all these spiritual traditions? Like what do they really have to offer us, you know, in the face of so many converging uh, catastrophes? And it was sometime during that period of time with those people that I came up with a, a simple motto for myself which preceded the apparitions by two or three years. And it was ecology, not theology. Mm. And that really shifted my whole way of thinking. And I found myself, both of us found ourselves rereading all these spiritual texts, the Bible, You everything. can use it as a kind of guide. And it, yeah. I mean, I think one of the things we forget is that Clark and I immersed ourselves in the study of paleoanthropology and climate change. And one of the things is, you know, religion and science emerge together at the same moment in human history. They're both responses to the same issue, which is agriculture. And I, I often joke that monocrops, monocultures, create monotheisms, create Monsanto. You know, this is how we've gotten <laughs> the mess we're in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in a place where we, you know, we're poisoning the very soil that right. creates and nourishes our right. food. Right. And, and so, the alternative to that is is multiplicity and diversity, radical multiplicity and yeah. diversity. And what we often say at Way of the Rose is we value uh, circles of friendship, not lineages of power. Yeah. And what does it mean to live in circles again? Mm -hmm. um, and to live live in a storytelling culture where we where we we tell our stories, right? And we take We're both this, storytellers. Yeah. If, if we are anything, we are storytellers. I come by it naturally through my Irish heritage and the gift of gab. And Clark comes it through Mark Twain and the South and Arkansas and Missouri and Mississippi. So the two of us can't shut up. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have to jump in. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. I have so much I want to dive into because we are headed into such an incredible time. I have some um, astrology nerdiness to share and some other things about the age of Aquarius and, and diving into Our Lady. Um, but I want to introduce April and her journey here. So I was putting together this show and it just for whatever reason, I was like, April has to be a part of this. I really wanted her to be a part of it. And I felt like, April, you have something to bring. And I just want you, I know you just finished the book. And I wanted you to just share a little bit about where you're at and what your thoughts are around all of this, because I know you have a lot to share as well. Lisa, Lisa thank you so much. I, I feel so privileged that you thought of me. Um, and I feel like really there's so much going on with the divine feminine as far as that goes that all of us uh, that are, you know, aware and want to continue awareness and remember who we are, are really uh, getting a lot of messages mm -hmm. right now in the last, you know, especially it feels um, to me really sped up in the last six months or so, or maybe even year. And I'm not even correlating that with, you know, our, uh, the COVID issues and all of that. It's just something that's arising in this. And for me, I feel like it's this incredible amount of beauty, this mm -hmm. haunting beauty that is 
connecting us through sorrow and through these places of being nothing but fully human. You know, like instead of the transcendence that we've tried to find through religion for thousands of years, we transcend the body, we transcend the mind and all of this. It's coming back to this idea of um, imminence, of mm. being here and feeling what it feels like to have fingers and toes and this kind of sloppy community, you know, not this perfect little boxed in, you know, spaces that where everything's all clean and tidy. That's just not what what it is. And I just I, I read today the um the chapter on uh the dirt in Arkansas and it was so beautiful. <laughs> it said, I was in the dirt but I'd never felt dirty. And that's <laughs> so profound, you know, and that's where we're digging our hands into in this in this beautiful like you know, potential of what is also to come. There's a lot going on that we have not necessarily found success in. However, I feel like the potential that we are coming upon, um, that we're able to unlock as these old patriarchies and, um, you know, even the divine masculine starts to show through because that's also incredibly powerful and, and it has to be balanced. It can't just go all the way over to this other thing. You know, we have to stay very balanced through both things and it's gonna take a lot longer to balance the, the feminine because of what we've experienced for thousands of years of that type of um, suppression. And we also have to, I believe, honor the divine masculine, whatever that means. I'm not, I'm not quite there yet, um, because, you know, I, it, it, the divine feminine is the thing that's really uh, coming to me. And I believe um, really exerting and, and showing up at this time. You know, one of the things that really, for a couple, and we wrote this book together as male and female, and that involved a lot of alchemy. Um, and alchemy can be explosive. <laughs> you know, sometimes our kids would come into the room and say, stop writing. And we'd say, we can't, we have to keep writing. <laughs> um, but the divine feminine, the divine masculine often used to be referred to as the heroes gamos, the sacred marriage of masculine feminine er energies that can happen within the individual, that can happen within a couple, can, can happen with same sex couples. It, 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 it's a bigger idea than simply it happens gender in nature. and happens in nature yeah. too. Trees yeah. can be both sexes simultaneously, yeah. but the rosary, which we've written a book about, which is way older than Christianity, way older than religion, combines at its most basic, if you can see the rosary, I'm holding up their red beads and white beads. Well, the white beads are the female beads, the martyrs, the prayers to the mother, but the red beads are the father beads, the prayers to the father. And so there are mothers and fathers, mamas and papas in here. Although I would add that there are more mothers than there are fathers. <laughs> <laughs> because like we do need to do a little rebalancing. Yeah. You know, patriarchy doesn't work for the patriarchs. And you know, it, if you look at men, you know, if you look at our kind of example of mm. men making it, they look miserable. You know, we talk about toxic masculinity, it's toxic to themselves. Matriarchy isn't the opposite of patriarchy. It's a completely different system. Mm. It's a system where everybody is a mother. Men and women. Well, I, I think that the the uh, the carrying of life and the bringing forth of life uh, from within a woman's body uh, and the connection to the moon, to the tides, to so many things and to the earth itself uh, gives in women a kind of an anchor to the earth, which allows them to see the correct, in many cases, the correct balance of those energies. I think men can get lost in their heads. They can, you know, you mentioned this sort of transcendent impulse. They can develop, you know, these fantasies of, of escaping from matter, which, you know, literally, you know, goes back to the, the word mater for mother, right? There's this idea that they can escape from that, or they should escape from it, or that they should dominate it, right? Uh, you know, women are certainly under no illusion that they should be dominated. <laughs> I don't think maybe in really conservative communities, they feel like that. But, but, uh, but beyond that, you know, 
the obverse would be that they they understand the those the interplay of those energies. The rosary is a way of rebalancing uh, those energies that basically subjects us to a kind of a spiritual reparenting. When we pray these masculine and feminine prayers, and we go through this cycle of mysteries, which just mirrors the ancient, most ancient mystery religions of the of the of the Mediterranean uh, uh, world and Upper African con uh, continent then we experience a kind of a recalibration with uh, the turning of the seasons, and this endless dance of soul and Luna, the sun and the moon or earth. Right? To go back to ecology, yeah. the lady is the earth, the matter of this earth, the dirt. And we say there's one word this book encompasses our religion, it's dirt. <laughs> dirt, is, dirt is where it's at. Yeah. And we know that now with climate change, by the way. Yeah. Soil regeneration is the single most important thing we can do for the climate right now. Dirt, we need dirt in order to survive. Yeah. So it's the dirt of this planet, the water of this planet. And in order to create life, you add to that sunlight, you know? And that's the ecological equation. Sunlight plus water and earth creates life. Blue plus yellow equals green. Mm -hmm. That's the equation we all live inside of. Yeah. Mm, that's so beautiful. You know, and the idea that you can be all light, you know, that uh, <laughs> that leads to a very cold and sterile and lifeless world. A desert. And, yeah, and the belief that you can be all matter, uh, you know, with no with no light, you know, leads to a, a, a real cold materiality where there's no uh, joy and upsurgence of that sort of chakra-like growth life force energy. So the two have to come together to produce that energy and to sustain life. Well, and it's an amazing and auspicious uh, conversation because we're in the middle of a oh, they're together. Moral eclipse. And right. so the earth today, our great mother is sandwiched between the sun and the moon today. So we are, we are being pressed against both of those cosmic forces of the sun and the moon and the yin and the yang and the male and the female. And so even what we're talking about is just so incredibly powerful because we do need both and and what you're talking about the soil too i i follow dr zach bush and and he's so oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> oh my gosh and essential essential, essential. <laughs> yeah yes the protection of our soil and the healing of our soil you know i think that's a really important thing for all of us to understand and what does it mean to nurture the soil um, you know, do you have soil at your home or in your yard or mm -hmm. in, in a container? And, you know, how do you honor that? So I love what you guys are bringing up right now. It's so beautiful. And we also can't be afraid of dirt. Our culture is very, we valued spiritually ideas of purity. And you talked about the mess, April, that kind of divine mess. And, you know, I always laugh when people clean up their yards of leaves and fallen branches because the trees are trying to make dirt. <laughs> They're working really hard at making dirt and it looks messy, but it's that divine disarray that is what generates life. It's beautiful. I want to invite everybody who's watching right now. Don't forget that you can ask your questions or share your own comments. We love that when you do that. So don't be afraid. It only takes one comment. And I love to hear where you're from too. So do share that. Um, so we're coming into this time. Obviously, 2020 is unprecedented. I think that's all we can say about that. Um, but we're also coming up some astrology that we're coming into is a Saturn Jupiter conjunction here in December, um, right at the solstice. And both of these planets are moving into Aquarius. So it really marks this stepping into the air and the Aquarius and this age of divine feminine. And so this is for all three of you guys, you know, what do you feel about where we're headed? Um, and, and how has our lady guided you this year in regards to that? Because there's, there's so much darkness, but it's the light that comes out of the darkness. And I think all four of us here understand that, you know? And so how do we, how do we go forward and what does that look like? So are some big questions, but. <laughs> well, the first gospel, the first words of Our Lady to Clark of any extended speaking were, were something she called the gospel according to the dark. And that can be found on our website at wayoftherose.org. And Clark wrote a whole book about it called Waking Up to the Dark. You know, you talk about the yin and yang. And we have privileged light over darkness. And this soil is dark. 
good soil is dark and we grow in darkness of wombs. We grow in the seeds grow in the darkness of soil. And this is the dark time of the year that we're entering. Mm. Um, and we've been very frightened of darkness as a culture. Although we torture people by keeping the lights on all the time. Mm. And we torture ourselves by doing that. Mm. So I've often wanted to decolonize that word darkness um, that we, you know, and what are we looking at? I can tell you what the climate science says. Most people are too frightened to read it. And I think one of the questions I have, oh, I see somebody is from Tara from Stockholm, Sweden. Hi Tara. Hi Tara. Tara, you know, I, it's so interesting. You signed on right at that moment because Our Lady first appeared to Clark on June 16th, 2011. And we said, why June 16th? What's that day about? Bloomsday from Ulysses, eh, nothing really. And then we discovered that June 16th in 1972 was the date where. The, 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 it's the day that the Stockholm report was issued by the UN, UN and it, it was the day on which the earth was formally uh, conferred with legal rights by a governing international body. It's the first time in history. The rights of the done. earth. That's right. And, you know, we still struggle with that. You know, we know lawyers who are trying to give rivers rights, legal right. rights in the courts and mountains rights and oceans, rights, and they don't have any in our legal system. Mm. You know, the chapter we, we had the hardest time writing this book, someone asked us, was the chapter about hope. <laughs> 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 and, um. and it's complicated because what are we hoping for? Are we hoping that things go back to normal? Yeah, I mean, if we're if we're hoping to, we have a, we have a friend actually who who describes it this way. He says the abiding hope of most Americans is that they will be able to drive to Walmart to buy cheap shit forever, <laughs> right? <laughs> that that is right. That we can we that we can persist in this, right? That this is that a growth economy is possible on a right, finite planet, right? That, that, that capitalism, be, that with a little tinkering, will get capitalism and civilization just right. Right. Well, the, the, with a little tinkering, we'll get you know, infinite growth on a finite planet just right, right? I mean, what does that look like? You know, faster depletion of the soil, fa faster depletion of the re world's resources, you know, more hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. I mean. So a question for us has been, what are we hoping for? And how do we align our prayers with the prayers of mountains and rivers and oceans again. And what mm. would that look like? Mm -hmm. One of the things that changes is Our Lady talks a lot about the long story of our souls. And when we look at the long story in the big picture, the past 10,000 years of human history is not very long. For hundreds of thousands of years, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals have lived on this planet in a way that was genuinely sustainable. Now, how we're going to get back to that is not something I think the technocrats are going to figure out for us. I don't think it's anything that human beings are going to figure out. The earth will figure uh, that out for us one and way is. or another and is figuring it out. Uh, I sometimes, uh, well, I'll tell you, I, When I started praying the rosary uh, after the apparitions uh, began, you know, I had a kind of a, a hard time with it in the beginning. I mean, I like, I loved the prayers. Uh, Our Lady had invited me to do it. And so, you know, I was very enthusiastic about it. But at the same time, I realized that the only other men that I had seen or that I knew of who prayed the rosary were conservative Catholic men. And so I began to, you know, Like somebody would notice that I pray the rosary and I would start and say, yeah, I pray the rosary, but, right? <laughs> and then I would say, but I, I'm not a right to lifer, but I, I'm not an anti-abortionist, but I'm, I'm not against feminism, but I believe in climate change, right? And I would have to go through this whole litany because the assumption would be if I pray the rosary as a man, that I was in alignment with the Catholic Church. So for, uh, you know, I got together with some of my male friends. I, I did have a few male friends like myself who prayed the rosary and I began to ask like, well, what? You know, these Catholic conservative men, they're really clear about what they believe, right? 
they know what they're praying the rosary for. They want to pray the rosary to like, you know, end abortion, right? <laughs> So they're clear. So I thought, wow, I need clarity. Like I need a clarity that can stand up to that clarity. And finally, I, what it came down was for me was that ultimately for me, the, the rosary is a prayer for the earth to win. Because if the earth wins, then human beings win. If human beings win, human beings lose, right? Yeah. There is no winning at the game of human domination. We will destroy ourselves and take much of the planet down with us if we if we play that game. The only game is the game, the only sustainable long-term game is the one in which the earth continuously wins, and we're part of that winning. A lot of times people say to me, what can I do? What can I do about climate change? Should I recycle more? Should I quit meat? Should I, you know, ever since Genesis, we've been trying to figure out a way to game civilization. That's what Leviticus is all about. If you do these rules, we might make civilization work. Civilization isn't going to work. It's an addiction that's killing us. When we ask what, you know, the hope of the attic is that they can find a way to keep on drinking, right? Mm. Mm. And we are addicted to civilization. Yeah. How do we become sober and what does sobriety from civilization look like? For me, this is what it looks like, this little handful of seeds. Because this little handful of seeds shows me how to claim joy, bear witness to sorrow with courage, not look away from sorrow, not be frightened of it, and how to rebirth magic and miracles into the world. Mm. And if I can do those three things, I can find my way through anything. Mm. Mm. And that's what we're learning how we've got to learn how to do. We we have put our faith in money and technology. How do we put our faith in the earth again? Mm. You know, uh, it's a good question. What exactly are we addicted to? I think Perdita's right. We, we are addicted to civilization. But the truth is, that's not all there is to us. I think that when people, you know, sort of go belly up these days and just say, that's it, you know, we're cashing in our chips, we'll go extinct, you know, what they're really saying is they don't know how to conceive of human life in the absence of human civilization. But human beings had something else, something more durable, something more beautiful, uh, some, something more, you know, fundamentally wholesome and healthy for uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years before they had civilization, and that was culture. Human beings mm. had culture. You talked about beauty, April. Yeah. And one of the things is when people are devoted to the lady, beauty reappears. Yeah. It's not this Puritan, you know, bleak, concrete, chrome world. They created the art in the caves in France. They created those incredible goddess figurines. During the Middle Ages, when people were devoted to the lady, the music, the art, the poetry, it goes wild. And we have found this even in our Way of the Rose community. We have this lively Facebook group, as you know, and the art, the music, the poetry, it's just, it's just explosive. It just pours out of people. The lady calls forth our creativity, our imagination, and our possibility, and our beauty. Mm. April. <clears throat> That's beautiful. <laughs> um, I had, I was in um, some deep meditation uh, maybe a month or two ago, and I had a visitation by this, you know, uh, app, you know, an apparition that was a skeleton with you know big garland around her head and light coming pouring forth and so I asked her who she was and I just have my journal here I'm reading from and she says I'm Muerte Maria and I was like okay <laughs> all right uh so she says um uh she said to me that physical death means nothing there are no veils the death of lifetime habits or patterns are more significant you are here to Beautiful. teach death. This said, watch. She had lights in the center of all of her bones that shone out. Then she put skin on, and it will. All the light went out. She did this a few times so I could see. And she said, "See how the light shines from death, but is concealed by flesh. Light shines out from death." 
And, you know, after that, we, uh, we had one of our very dearest friends pass in the middle of October, really mm -hmm. unexpectedly. He was only 35 years old and he, he died in the middle of the night of coronary artery disease. And, you know, our community together has kind of walked this path, but she, she almost, you know, paved the way in a really profound way. And, you know, my work on this earth is really, I'm a yoga therapist, I'm a life coach, I do a lot of NLP work, but really what it comes down to is acknowledging our habits and patterns, whether it's postural or mental or even spiritual or how we, you know, how we treat, you know, behaviorally. And when we realize those patterns and habits, which I think was her message to me, that's the real powerful in to uh, um, a way of April, violence, can I ask you a question? Really. Yes. You know, Did you know about Santa Muerte yes. before your vision? Do you know about her? No. I looked her up. I looked her up and, you know, of course, there was like the exact picture of the being that I saw. <laughs> you yeah. know, with the rosary. And the hand, devotees of Santa Muerte are really devoted to the yeah. rosary. Yeah. In fact, convicts devoted to her make rosaries to share with people. Mm. Amazing. It all ties in. It all ties in. So, um, I mean, that was, wow. those were some really powerful. Our lady has said very me. similar things. I, I mean, felt. What you realize is that, you know, what looks like a death on this side of the veil is a birth on the other. And just as there are loved ones waiting for the birth of that child, there are on the other side people waiting for the birth. It's just a, back, a perpetual back and forth like a mm -hmm. thread. The veil is woven of our souls back and mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, April, I, 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 when we first went on our book tour, uh, we, we did our book launch at the Open Center. And uh, so, you know, we had a lot of people from the publishing world there and a lot of our Way of the Rose members from New York and things like that. But there were a lot of new people in the, uh, in the audience as well. We read from the book and then we did a, a Q&A and uh, somebody raised their hand and said something along the lines of, isn't it very special to have an apparition of Our Lady? You must be so pleased or something like that. And it, it just seemed like the worst kind of a trick question or a trap. Right. <laughs> what do you say to something like that? But I had this moment and suddenly I looked out at this group of, you know, 80, 90, 100 people, however many. And I suddenly knew that they were all there because they had had some kind of direct life changing experience, a locution, a, a visitation, an apparition, a, a reprieve, a, a, dream. a dream, something that had brought them into that room. And I said, and how many of you here have experienced something like this? And almost every hand went up. And I think that you're right. Um, the last six months, the last year, but I think it's been going on even longer than that. Uh, and eight, a lot of people will tell you that the, the age of Marian apparitions, like the great age of Marian apparitions begins in 1830 with the uh, uh, miraculous metal apparition in Paris. But if you look at the records, and I'm not talking about the real records because nobody really knows how many apparitions there have been, but just the ones that are tabulated by the Catholic Church, meaning these are ones they're going to look into, right, just to see what happened. There are 500 apparitions since 1830. And if you look at the frequency of those apparitions and make a graph out of it, from 1830, it goes like this. And when it gets to like toward the end of, of, of the millennium and into the noughts and into the 2020s, it goes straight up. Mm. So it's happening everywhere to so many people. People are getting messages and to prepare them. And Our Lady comes traditionally in times when we need a helping hand. Yeah. Yeah. She traditionally appears. She appeared before the genocide in Rwanda. She appeared before the civil war in Bosnia. She appeared to Catherine Lamare before the revolution. And so. she appeared during the Mesoamerican genocide to an Aztec Indian. Yeah. Right in the center of it, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Yeah. Mm. You know, so she comes when things 
And what she always says the same message, which is, this is going to be a little scary, but hold mom's hand. It's like we're in the parking <laughs> lot and we're toddlers. Hold my hand, right? <laughs> That's what the, mom, the mothers always say to their children. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah. That's the short. Uh, you think you've got this and you do not. <laughs> <You know? laughs> she has definitely been in my space this year. And, I, you know, I've thought a lot about her since I this book landed in my life. And and I found that rose in the middle of you know, my dad's cabin in Cuesta and right. yeah. And she's been so much a guide this year for me, but it made me think a lot. You know, I went to St. Mary's church. That was where I was, went through my Catholic journey as a child and, and was confirmed in St. Mary's church and St. Mary was my saint in confirmation. So it was all kind of an interesting journey for me. And, um, I was able to go to, to Notre Dame in Paris um, about seven years ago now. And when I went, I went directly to, they have all the saints around Notre Dame. And I went straight to St. Mary and lit a candle there for Father Lenick, who is my priest, who I'm sure has long since passed and, and wanted to honor him and honor St. Mary. And, and it just seems profound to me in my own journey that Notre Dame burnt yeah. right before all of this happened. And it really jumped out to me when I saw that happening and the recognition that I had been there before that had happened and that this was significant to what we were stepping into this year and, and what was coming. And, you know, where I felt as a child very connected to Mary, I loved saying Hail Marys. I loved my rosary. I was said them until my rosary fell apart, and I still have the pieces in my office right here. Um, but this year, the, her profound energy—it's like this container of the divine feminine, like guiding me through my journey, guiding the information and the transmissions that are coming through me to the community, even Buddhist biohacker here. I mean, the, the gold and the pink is the rose gold flame of Mary Magdalene. I mean, that's what this is. So even in, in, you know, my creative flow and my branding. And so it's really been just beautiful to know that she's there when so much is in flux. And as everything changes externally around us, it's like she's this divine permanence is how I feel. It's like she never, that heart space is never gone. That that energy is always there. And it doesn't matter how many times you leave your house and the outside world looks different. Um, she's there. And I wanted to read this poem um, was really just stuck out to me in your new book. So now is the hour of her return for everybody who has not gotten this. If, if you love Kali and Durga and all that, oh my gosh. Um, but this poem, her patience is at an end. And I really love this because I think my life lesson is to learn patience. And I just felt that this was really beautiful. So I want to read this if you guys don't mind so that everyone can hear it. I snuck Kali Ma into a church to show her the blessed virgin and said, mother, what do you think of that? She's beautiful, said Kali, but her patience is at an end. Don't suppose she can't become black at a moment's notice. You see only her piously prayerful hands. Of the other two, one plots. The fall of Wall Street, the other takes the pulse of the Pope counting down his seconds like a bomb because his death is a sign of the end. Well, <clears throat> that was one of the more prophetic poems in the book. <laughs> you know, that book had an interesting uh, history. Um, I, when I first witnessed the apparition, I wasn't sure who she was. And it took 10 weeks. It took her actually inviting me to rise in the middle of the night and pray the rosary to realize who she was, you know, 
at that point, I thought, well, I'm not Catholic, but I'm also not stupid. <laughs> the only person who <laughs> invites you to pray the rosary and makes promises based on whether or not you do it is the Virgin Mary. But I, I was also kind of panicked. Oh, my God, now I'm going to have to become Catholic. You know, I didn't really... I really didn't really know what to do. And a big part of my confusion was that the uh, girl I had witnessed seemed so much more powerful and so much bigger than any uh, vision of the Virgin Mary that I had ever seen. I hadn't really studied Mary in medieval art. I hadn't read the miracle stories from the Middle Ages at that point. So I didn't, I really was kind of, you know, defaulted to what Perita calls the Valley of Virgins of the modern church, right? Those sort of pious downcast eyes and, you know, pastel robes and things like that. So I began to look around for an image in the world pantheon that felt like her. And then I discovered Kali. And I woke up one morning with a poem fully formed in my, like on my lips. And I literally took out a notebook and wrote it down. And uh, a couple of days later, I still hadn't made sense of it. I didn't know where it had come from. I've been writing poetry since my teens, but I'd never had a poem arrive fully formed like this. And all the poems in the book arrived that way. I don't even really very much feel like I wrote them. But then they were suddenly, you know, what, five, four or five months passed, they were all done. And it looked like it was uh, it was time to you know do something with them to publish them, but every time we tried to bring the project to bear, something would come up, and the, the project got delayed. It got delayed. It got delayed. We knew the title was "Now Is the Hour of Her Return," uh, and uh, finally, our lady said, you know, just this past year, she said, "The now of now is the hour of her return has arrived." So, and the book was published on Mary Magdalene's feast day yeah, of this year. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, so, right in the midst of the pandemic. So, she had held yeah. it off. She had held it off. Yeah. She wouldn't let it be published until then. So, but there are a lot of poems in the book that, that you know, have that ring to them. All of our ladies' messages, by the way, that she's given uh, to us are up on our website at wayoftherose.org. And you know, you give a sense of being prepared for something, loved, held, but prepared just as you were, April. Do you know what I mean? You know, that there's work we each have, she's giving us all work to do. Yeah. Um. <sighs> yeah. I feel a big, like, sigh, because, yes, there's so much work to do, really. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But one of the ways that we're guided to that work, and it's one of the things our lady said to Clark, she said to him early on after he prayed the rosary, what do you want? You haven't asked for anything. And she began exploring this idea with us of the heart's desire that she once said that in each of our hearts, she's planted a seed. And that's the cultivation of that seed of joy within us that, that leads us to the work we're mm -hmm. supposed to do in the world. And, one of the things I have noticed during COVID in our Way of the Rose community is the people who've been cultivating that seed have been kind of okay during this time. Yeah, They've known what to do. Right. And that that, that seed is like a compass it, it, mm -hmm. or it's like a flower that shows us where the sun is and where to walk mm -hmm. next within us. Mm -hmm. And we each have it. We each have joys that if we cultivate them will guide us. What her lady actually said was, was uh, she and, and April, you'll like this. She said, in every heart, there is something very much like a small handful of dirt, right? <laughs> like we think of our, you know, we want a pure heart. We want a true heart. Our lady says, no, you, you, what you really want is a dirt heart. <laughs> you want a little handful of dirt so that the seed of your heart's desire that is that is placed in that dirt can can bring forth the life you know that is within you and the joy that is within you and if we think of the chakra system the heart is green yeah you know, we want that we want a green heart mm -hmm. we want a heart where the the blues and the yellows and the golds have come together to make everything grow yeah, within us that's right 
That's beautiful. That reminds me. So this is my musical nerdiness, but one of my favorite musicals of all time is The Secret Garden. And one of my favorite oh. songs, <laughs> yes, one of my favorite songs is A Bit of Dirt. And it's so <laughs> beautiful because it's so profound beyond anything that that musical actually is. <laughs> I don't know if you've been back to the original book at all recently mm -hmm. since you were a child. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you and you, to reread The Secret Garden, Mary Frances Hudson Burnett or whatever her name is. Yes. That book is spiritually one of the wisest things I've ever read. Mm. Elders literature. Elders literature is where you find the spiritual heavy hitters. Mm. I'm going to go. I've got it on this bookshelf right behind me. So <laughs> it bears up. Okay. I'm going to do it. You guys are, look at all these great comments. Um, Adrian says she's tuning in from New Mexico, one of our favorite spots. Um, she said, thank you for illuminating the power and wisdom of Our Lady. We need her more now than ever. Thank you, Adrian, for listening. We've got folks from Flagstaff, Arizona, Centennial, Colorado, Albany, New York. Nina says she just finished your book a couple weeks ago and she loved it. And Tara says, Clark, I have heard you say that you recite Hail Mary in Latin. Could you please do it here? I would love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I'll, I'll sing it because uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the Latin itself just sounds like Latin. But the Gregorian chant for the rosary, which is the way it would have been uh, prayed by a lot of people during the Middle Ages, uh, has its own sort of special uh, rhythm. So it goes like this. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, Ora pro nobis peccatoribus, non et in ora, mortis nostre. Amen. You know, for the nerds about the Hail Mary, you might think it's a pious Catholic prayer. <laughs> Actually, if I can go Da Vinci Code on you. <laughs> It's a goddess prayer that got in ancestral grandmothers and mothers hid their devotion to the goddess in the words of the Hail Mary. And in fact, they hid their devotion to the triple goddess, who I'd love to pay a little tribute today on the full moon. The Hail Mary prayer was a popular prayer. It came out of people who had been devoted to the goddess for thousands of years. You can go to towns in Europe where they've traced their DNA and the same people have been living in these towns for 8,000 years. So <laughs> Christianity comes in and they, okay, you want us to call her Mary, we'll call her Mary, whatever, you know, <laughs> but we know who she is. Yeah. And they took some words from the Bible and they added in their own words and created the prayer Clark just sang to you. But that prayer has three parts. Ave Maria, gratia plena dominus tecum means hail mary full of grace the lord or the light is with thee so think of that light and that's the maiden that's that maiden just beginning to come into bloom moon that seven, you know that powerful joan of arc girl right and she is and the light is with thee the lord is with thee that's the heroes gamos that's sexuality, eroticism. That is in those tankas, those wonderful Buddhist tankas of the Lord and Lady copulating together. You're actually invoking that in the Hail Mary. Yeah. Benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That is the full moon. That's where we are today. That's that. That's that mama moon. That's the full moon, the mother in all her glory, pregnant with the life of this planet, this pregnant planet. Guadalupe, whose feast day is coming up, she appeared pregnant. That was the hope she showed to Juan Diego. Santa Maria, Mother Day, 
Ah, I've been really aggressive by the Dominic Tech. Dominic Tattoo and Molière. I've been an actor for the centuries, two years. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, Ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us now and at the hour of our death. And that's the dark of the moon. That's the crone mother. That Santa Muerta at the end. That Muerta is, Maria. There she is at the end, ready to take us. So we go from womb to tomb. The Hail Mary is a way of honoring the triple goddess and rehearsing our own passage from life through to death and back again and knowing that there's nowhere that Our Lady doesn't hold us. Yeah, She's always got us. And so it's a very radical prayer. I don't think most conservative Catholics know what they're praying. Well, I don't think they realize that. <laughs> I think they also yeah. they don't also don't realize that they're doing a straight up mantra practice. You know, that first part of the prayer, Ave Maria, Grazia, Plena, Dominus Tecum, which is just Hail Mary, uh, full of grace, the oh. Lord is with thee. That was the original form of the Hail Mary. It was repeated with no other prayers added on as a mantra. Uh, in the uh, accompanied by prostrations before a statue of the lady, and it was like a summoning spell to summon the uh, the presence of the lady. And this was the widespread practice in the early, uh, uh, you know, eleventh to twelfth and eleventh centuries. And this was this was where the rosary originated. I often say, do you know what the difference is between a spell and a prayer? It's a trick question. Like one. <laughs> It's what? A, it's a trick I question. There, there is, is no difference between a spell and a prayer. <laughs> Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. <laughs> the Hail Mary. In fact, there's a reason psychic. Almost all psychics. I've written a book with a psychic and known a lot. And almost all of them pray the rosary because it helps them go back and forth yeah. between the land of the living yeah. and the land of the dead. And you'll find if you pray it that you'll enter spaces where things go really back and forth. And it is a summoning yeah. spell for the dead. Yeah. The way in the Middle Ages, people prayed to get their dead to show up and to get the lady to show up. Yeah. Not, well, not, not as an idea, but... I mean, the word rosary comes from, from uh, an ancient uh, uh, Latin word that uh, pertained to roses, certainly, but it was a festival of the dead in, uh, in Roman times, right? Uh, Rosalia. And so the, the the tradition of praying the rosary we, we uh, that we have today uh, originated, you know, uh, thousands of years ago in uh, ancestor practice. Well, and that is like the the little block, you well, know, that goes into the, you know, those old like puzzle blocks, and it was like yeah. there was that one block. And for me, because the Hail Mary was. I loved it. And I was very, very lucky as a psychic medium to, I have, it runs in our family. So my family was open, but Father Lenick, and I think I told this story before, but when I got confirmed in the Catholic church and you have to meet with your priest and I told him, I wasn't sure what I thought. And he said to me, I know you see the angels. And he said, so do I. And he oh. said, that is why I do what I do every day. I mean, he was probably 85 at the time and he was such an incredible Guys, I had this really beautiful experience with Catholicism. It was not at all stressful or anything for me. And so just what you're talking about now, and, and when I read The Way of the Rose, it was like that missing piece of like, oh, because I have all of these people who come to me who have passed and who are looking for information. And that's my job is to communicate that information out. And um, it was like, oh, this is why I feel so connected to this energy is just what you're saying here. It's like that missing piece of information where it's like, oh, this is helping me to do what I came here to do. And interestingly enough, um, I had a very wild dream state last night, I think because of the moon. But I was awakened at like four o'clock ish this morning um, to a voice in my ear, a woman's voice saying, hello, get up. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, she knows that Clark and Perdita are coming on the show today, I think, and was like <laughs> waking me up at four o'clock this morning. So just a funny side note. But I just love hearing you guys talk about all of the 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 wisdom and history and information because it fills in those blanks for those of us who are drawn to it and really just have no idea what that really is about. 
You know, my next book, Lisa, is all about the dead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that's so interesting is that when Christianity first comes into Europe, the thing that they have the hardest time with is getting women to stop talking to the dead. <laughs> Max Dash, who writes about this in great deal, priests are always writing to each other or to their bishop, we can't get those damn women to stop talking to their dead. They won't listen to us. <laughs> And, and it's so interesting is that you realize is that's the multiplicity. Our lady revels not in one authoritative voice, but in all the different voices, all the voices of your ancestors, all of our ancestral mothers from all our different lives. And so that that's part of birthing the divine feminine mm -hmm. back into the world is birthing the dead back into the world right. and the dead at the bottom of our mm -hmm. lives because the dead are the dirt the dead are literally the dirt if yeah. you hold this handful of dirt in your hands you're holding dead trees dead oceans dead beings and a lot of live beings too yes <laughs> but, but you're holding the dead so we're holding the dead in our hands when we hold dirt. Yeah. And, and that's what we grow from. Mm. And so to deny the dead, to deny the darkness, to deny the dirt, we don't have anything to grow in. You know, uh, one of the uh, first things Our Lady uh, said to me, and the way she invited me to pray the rosary was she woke me up in the middle of the night and just like that, <laughs> speaking right in my ear. And I sat up in bed, you know, and she said, if you rise to say the rosary tonight, a column of saints will support your prayer. Now, I had been raised Catholic, you know, I'd been raised Protestant, and that had kind of a Christian ring to it, a little too much Christian ring for me, actually, initially. And I thought, well, you know, the community, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the communion of saints, I couldn't sort of wrap my mind around it. But eventually, uh, she made it very clear what she was talking about. She talked about the earth as the column of saints, the dirt going all the way down. And uh, in the chapter of The Way of the Rose, where a lady speaks, and, and there are 10 chapters at the very end where it's all her, just her words speaking. And the first one is called The Column of Saints, and uh, it's where she explained what she meant by that. And she says, I speak to you with one voice, but the voices below me are many, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's this feeling that she you know, she is our conduit to the, 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 the realm of our ancestors. She is the voice of our ancestors, localized and embodied in this, in this powerful, powerful maternal figure that endures from, you know, from one eon to the next. Those voices are her and she is those voices. So it's okay. like, it's that multiplicity, but, but it's a unity within that multiplicity and a singularity that, that follows us from, eon to eon that we can never be separate from and that will never forsake us because it is us. It's in us. Well, and it fills me up because I, I think I shared this story the other day. So pardon me for anybody who already heard this story, but um, I started, I knew I, B B BC before COVID um, I did <laughs> oh uh, stage readings. So I would, you know, be in front of an audience and speak to people who'd passed away and, did this for, I don't know, a year or so. And about a year into it, um, I was speaking to a man who had been killed in a motorcycle accident for a gentleman in the audience. And the gentleman was really emotional that was living, which was a unique thing for the kind of environment. Usually it's women and it's kind of a different thing. And, and it just really washed over me that what I was doing has nothing to do with those of us who are here. I realized in that moment that I'm really doing this for those who have passed on. It's mm -hmm. their healing. It's their words. It's their messages that have been lost. Yes. It's, yeah. it's so for them. It's not about us at all. And it just hit me. And ever since then, it really changed my work as a medium because of exactly what you're saying. There's so many souls that have left. There, there's many who've left this year. There, there's many more to come. And they have so much they want to share and so much they want to say. And and it's up to us to listen to them and to hear their voices and to, to turn off all the noise and really open ourselves up to this incredible world that exists outside of what we think is our reality. 
That's it in a nutshell. And, and you know, that's my hope. That it's not, there's not a technological innovation that's going to get us through climate change. The dead are going to guide us through climate They've done this. They've lived through climate change. I just finished this incredible book about Neanderthal life. I, my favorite kind of reading, you know, <laughs> 300,000 years in Europe, you know, they were resilient. They, they got through ice, they got temperature rises, shifting yeah. sea level changes. They will show us how to do it. If we get in conversation with them, if we learn how to be in conversation, and Santa, that's why Santa Muerta, I think, is showing up so much, because we've lost that conversation with, you know, the skinny white girl, as it were, she's often called in Mexico. That's you know? right, that's right. One of, one of, her, one of her many appellations. <laughs> you know, and- uh, Lady death, skinny white girl. Um, <laughs> Real skinny. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, we've, but that's it, you know, we have this, we have to start talking to our dead again. We have to start listening to our dead, all our dead. And I think people have forgotten how important that is. That was what we had before religion. We had the guidance of our ancestors. Mm. And we had people who helped us be in conversation with our ancestors. And that that is what we need more than anything. Mm. More than anything. So I bless you for your work, Lisa, and thank you for it. <laughs> You know what? I, I love it. And and the guidance from this year, you know, I'm actually getting ready to kick off kind of a new thing for me, but I'm going to start sharing their messages. I had a, enough appear this year that said, are you going, like, when are you going to start telling people what you're saying? So I've got a blog that's coming out this week. I'm going to start posting oh, the messages oh. because I have people who show up almost every single night at my bedside and I'm going to start sharing it. And that came through the work of this year because it is, they have a lot to say and, and they have these, these little love stories about their life and what they experienced in their transitions and, and things that they haven't been able to say. And so I'm going to start sharing those in a different way. Cause I think I just need to get them out there. So, yeah. So thank you. It's, it's my life. Yeah. That, and, and that's it. That's that's my hope. That's where my hope is in those stories coming back into the world and those conversations coming back into the world between the living and the dead. Mm -hmm. Well, in April, I want to give you a chance to share some stuff because I, I feel like we've let you be quiet. But <laughs> I do, I do want to say, you know, the ancestry is, you know, this 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 I, I have gotten many messages from spirit this year about the healing of our inherited lineages. And I really feel like there is such a message from Mother Earth about this is the time to purify our genetics, our, our lineages, our ancestry, and to step into us as, as star beings, as, as soul and to let go of these attachments to these lineages, to honor them, but to step beyond them. And I'm excited to see how that unfolds over the next few years, because I think there's so much more to come with that too. Oh. Thank you, Lisa. I've, I've been having a really nice time just sitting here supporting because it's been <laughs> here and listen to the wisdom. I also um, really draw very heavily on history. I was a history teacher for over a decade and I just, you know, it's so powerful to get back and to mine this, these riches of our of our past, which are, you know, and I guess in quantum physics, they're still happening in a way. And, yeah. you, know, so, you know, this timeline that we have as logical beings is not even really that logical if we really get down to what is happening. So I, I agree. I, I feel very strongly that it's not, it, it's purification is a good word. And um, also, I think, you know, you just did our summit on this and it's about remembering who we actually are. And all of that is there behind us. It's all within us, in our strands of DNA and, you know, in our makeup of our physical bodies. I mean, we know that we're carbon. We know that we're literally stars, right? So I think that that's really powerful to, to come back to who each of us are and 
And, you know, that's what I love to do in my work is, um, you know, the potential is not potential is already within. I've got a friend that is a musician and he has his um, he has his students come and they say, I'm not I don't play music yet. And he said, a rose. I think this is um, the man who who wrote the book, uh, The Game of Tennis or something. But he says, you know, a rose is always a rose, whether it's a seed or whether it's a bud or whether it's a full on rose. It doesn't matter. It's always a rose. And so I think that that is really profound in the way that we move forward in the way that we think how, how can I remember who I actually am? Because when we repair our own hearts and, and you know, it's not even necessarily about repairing the, all these language is like this languaging is very archaic in a way, you know, to heal, to grow, to progress, to do, it's very linear and it's very like masculine, but to, to know that you're already the seed you're all you are that already already there your strength is there your history is there your lineage is there your 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 heart unknotting your heart you know i love that uh, i think perdita says this in the book where she pra prays the rosary to unknot the heart which is you know it's not that the heart is not there or that we need to add anything to what we're doing it's that we need to refine and step back and say, what can I allow to move out in order that I can remember who I am? And we remember who we are, we remember who everyone is, and we remember who our mother is, and we remember who the earth is, and we remember, you know, it's like this, the, the, the scales just fall from our eyes, I feel. That's at least my journey and the journey I've seen. Uh, remembering, it's not the adding on of anything. It's not the what can I do next? What diet can I do now? What <laughs> what can I like? How what I miss, what can I you know? It's like we're always getting barraged that we're not enough. You know, it's from the toothpaste commercials on TV that says your teeth can be whiter and you won't get you know cavities to you know all the way into everything else. And if we just say stop, that is not what we are. You know, April, I, I did an interview earlier uh, this year with a guy named Ron Persu who wrote a book called Mac Mindfulness. Like it's got a little Donald, Ronald McDonald uh, uh, Buddha on the cover. But he talked about, you know, the way ways in which, for instance, even the mindfulness movement, which was basically really powerful and wholesome, was sort of co-opted by some corporate types of people. And he said that the idea was to get people to privatize their own well-being rather than to look to their world to like nurture them and the relationships to nurture them. There was this oppressive feeling that people were having. And he said, especially younger people, that now they're in charge of their health. They're in charge of their diet. They're in charge of, you know, their yoga. They're in charge of everything. Like that there's no support. There's no inner, um, there are no structures still in place to help people lead kind of sane, healthy lives. You know, and you're just, you're just responsible for sort of cobbling it together as best you can. And it's really it's tiresome. And it, I think it's frightening, that thought, rather than to be able to default to some inner sense of wholesomeness, which I think is what you're talking about, that informs our lives from within. I mean, Our Lady very much, you know, has this feeling of, you know, hand inside of glove, you know, like she, she reaches up inside of us like a glove and occupies our life and helps us to, you know, to find our health and to pursue our heart's desires. But there's never this sense of an ought or a should or, you know, you have to be healthy and you have to be healthy in this way. <laughs> well, I think to go back to also to what you were saying about there's a, you know, our language traps us sometimes. And, and I go back to ecology, not theology. The world lives in circles, not lines. There's one straight line in nature. And that's sunlight. It's not really Sunbeam. straight. And it's not even straight, it bends. So even it circles back really on itself in quantum bend. mechanics. But <laughs> everything's a circle. You know, everything is circular. And when we live in circles again, progress no progress becomes an illusion. When we live in circles again, even if you look at root, there's no such thing, forgive me, as a lineage. We live inside, we live inside entanglements. 
if you go back four generations and you chart, you're just your mothers and your fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, you'll have a root ball behind you. <laughs> you'll be you'll be seated in the ground with a root ball. Now, we've traumatized ourselves with straight lines mm -hmm. because they create systems of domination. All those lineages are designed to tell us who's at the top of the line and who's at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The Buddha's at the top, I'm at the bottom. The Pope's at the top, I'm at the bottom. You know, it's all. <laughs> and in truth, we're all just a circle of friends. And those friends include the trees and the mountains and the animals. Human beings are just animals. And when we can be animals again, when we can remember what it means to be an animal and not think that being a, being a human is, is better or different or progress or evolution or anything like that, mm -hmm we can rediscover our mm. joy in being part of this incredible mm. gift of a planet. Because when we were animals, we lived in communities. We worked, quote, to find food, probably an hour a day. We made music, we sang, we cuddled all day long. We, we, had we, had, we didn't raise our children by ourselves in some catastrophe of, of nuclear parenting. So we, I hope the animal dead will guide us too. And I hope our far dead will guide us to being animals on this planet again. And really, like you said, discovering our com cosmic entanglement with each other, mm -hmm. that we're all connected and interdependent. Mm -hmm. all, and that means we're held by each other, we're not alone. The dead are there for us. The animals are there for us. The dirt is there for us. The dirt. Our lady once said, "You don't think I'm real? Go outside and pick your fit up and put it down. <laughs> Tell me what happens." <laughs> he said, "If your foot goes through the ground as if it were made of air and not dirt, then you are free to doubt me. If not, <laughs> do not doubt me." <laughs> I love that. Well, and I love too, April, you brought up the stars and, you know, the dirt, the dirt is proven to have stars in it as well. So there's this beautiful blend of it all in, in something so simple as the dirt. And there's nothing more profound than putting your bare feet on the earth, I think, to bring you back into the present moment. And Tara shared, she says, I dreamt of my father the very day he passed away as his usual self. So I was glad that I would be meeting him in my dreams and that he is not gone. Thus, I always say death taught me about life too. That's really beautiful, Tara. Beautiful. It reminds me, I, earlier this year, I had this little thing, you know, how little poems and things pop into your head, you know, and, and I was writing and, and what I had written, it said, um, death or death, pff, darkness only tries to hide. But when you see the darkness, there is always a light inside. And it was so <laughs> profound and beautiful because it's so true. And I had this vision that came with it of, you know, we're all afraid of the darkness of the shadow. We talk about this collective shadow that's across our planet right now. But, you know, when, when I turn out all the lights, and this was what came to me when I wrote that down, when you turn out all the lights and you sit in darkness, that's when the spirits come out. They come out and they, they join you and they want to be a part of your life. And so we have to remember that when we are experiencing darkness, that's the moment that we are more connected to spirit than we ever are when those lights are turned on in your home or when, when you feel like all is great in the world is usually when you're least connected. It's usually when the darkness and the shadow rises that, and you know, the isolation, if you're in quarantine or whatever's happening right now, um, that you can connect with spirit and commune with the dead and, and connect with our lady and whoever it is you want to connect with. When you're in the darkness, sometimes really dark, and really get all the lights off. Feel the darkness as our mother's body touching your body. Because that's the way people used to experience it. That's the black Madonnas that you see all around the world. Madonna was until recently depicted with blacks because our primordial mothers were black, but also because the dirt is black, because the night is black. The night is black. Yeah. And that, you know, I won't, Clark is not afraid of the dark. And it was the first thing I learned about it. <laughs> and he not loves the, first the dark. Thing. Not no, the first thing. That's not the first thing. But 
<laughs> but you know, if this guy will hike up, he would hike up mountains in the middle of the night without a flashlight. And what he taught me is how to, when you go out in the dark, we're taught as women particularly, the darkness of cities is terrifying, mm. right? Because we live in such a violent world. And and yet the darkness of the forest at night is not, it's quite safe actually. No, it is, it's quite safe. And the darkness is, you know, I've been, I've been walking, uh, getting up to go for walks in the middle of the night uh, since I was a little boy. And uh, I would slip out, you know, onto a local golf course. And I kept doing it all my life. And, and Our Lady first appeared uh, during that period of time I called, quote, the hour of God, that sort of space that opens up between the first and the second sleep of the night only recently rediscovered by uh, researchers at the National Institutes of Health. But uh, that's a really uh, sacred, holy time when the mind, you know, in the absence of artificial lighting, right, just naturally en enters into a very deep and profound uh, uh, meditative state. And the Bible and the Song of Songs, the lover says, I sleep, but my heart is awake. Well, it turns out that's not just poetry. That's the description of an actual physical state that all human beings revert to if you take them off electrical lighting. And, you know, the, the fear of the dark is something we create in children. Yeah. Until very, children are not naturally frightened of the dark. What they're frightened of is being alone in the dark. Yeah. And it's only in our berserk culture that we expect little children to sleep by themselves. In the dark. Which is, and so, of course, they naturally become very, very frightened. And but children who are raised in communal sleeping situations with the family bed are not frightened at all, in, or of the dark. We used to. We had a family bed, and Clark would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, and our daughter would just be sitting up, looking at the moon, communing, just ecstatically. Yeah, she was on that schedule. And Clark would open his eyes, and she'd go. She's just sitting there, and she'd say, "Hi." <laughs> <laughs> She'd be so. sitting bolt upright the way, you know, very young children will. They have that perfectly straight back. She'd be sitting up in bed right between us, wide awake. Happy, but she wouldn't happy, wake us happy up. Happy as she could be, just sitting there, you know. Just grew. And children will do that. And we can rediscover and claim that power that's part of our feminine power that has been denied to us. You know, Santa Muerte's power is the power of Arishkagel, Anana's dark sister at the bottom of the earth, you know, that that's where we can really claim it. And, you know, the rosary itself is a very, very, uh, it's a dark prayer, a numinous prayer. And, uh, you know, people will often say, like when they join our Way of the Rose group on Facebook, uh, they'll often say, uh, wow, you know, I just started praying the rosary. I started praying it again. And about a week into it, they'll say, but I've got this problem because whenever I, pray it, I get drowsy and sometimes say, yes, this is not a problem. <laughs> it's the reason why psychics will often pray the rosary in preparation for their sessions. Those 10 Hail Marys take you into a deep, numinous place and you, you don't stay there forever. You come out of it because you have to say our father after 10 Hail Marys. And so it creates this kind of a wave-like rhythm that positions us right along the borderline between uh, consciousness and, and a dream state. And so frequently, you know, even people who don't think of themselves as psychics or don't normally, you know, hear guiding voices or, or you know, if they see something, they just dismiss it as an optical illusion or whatever. Even those people, if they pray the rosary uh, every day, will find that they begin to experience uh, a dipping in to that numinous, darker, dimmer realm. And, you know, the rosary has mysteries in it. We, you know, and that's, we won't go into mysteries, but mystery is about darkness. And it's about the things we can feel. In the darkness, we can feel things. And I think our sex lives would get better if we turned out the lights, too. Just saying. <laughs> No, I'm serious. I think artificial it certain, light is... It would, it would certainly eliminate the porn epidemic because there's no such thing as porn without light. Yes, exactly. <laughs> People learn how to touch each other again yeah. instead of perform for each other. Yeah. And, I mean, it, it's, you know, this pornification of our culture is this endless light-filled mirror. Yeah. But um, what was I going to say? I forgot. The mama in me has is, is got going on that. Um, <laughs> mysteries. You were talking about... Mystery. Mystery. Yeah. We don't 
can't, we think we have to know everything or explain everything. You know, there's a wonderful story about Kali stones we read in India. And this anthropologist go, goes to the villagers and said, how did Kali get into the stone? And they said, how are we supposed to know how goddesses do things like that? <laughs> that, that is a, that's the relationship to life we need again. Yeah. I don't know how it works. Yeah, people, people in, uh, you know, Perdita and I developed, I don't know, about, about 20 years ago or so, a term we call a belief sphere to explain how certain kinds of things, especially miraculous or things that would seem to defy, you know, logic or science can happen in certain places, but not in others. And the, uh, the way we came to the idea was they, they, they took this team to uh, Nepal to investigate these young teenage monks who had mastered this technique of inner heat. And they would wrap themselves in uh, sheets, soaking wet sheets, and they would go out and they would lie on a mountainside in the snow, you know, at, you know, 15, 18,000 feet. And they would wake up in the morning, they would have slept soundly. The, the sheets would have dried from their body heat, right? So this is, they went, they took a, a camera crew who almost died observing <laughs> it, right? almost froze to death in their parkas and their, their mittens and their, mittens <laughs> and their electric heat mm -hmm. and everything they brought the same teenagers back to cambridge to, to harvard put them in a deep freeze and they couldn't do it and they asked an older monk there was an older monk who was able to do it a little bit and they asked him what their problem was he said yeah well you know the, we don't have the deities here the mountain deities aren't here. The mountain deities are what keep us warm, right? And so that idea of a belief sphere and light and our hyper-lit, hyper-information, hyper-rational, hyper-analytical society is it has its own massive uniform belief sphere and it tries to suppress every other way of, of being in the world. But there are much older, much wiser, much more powerful ways of being. There are other belief spheres. And when we get together, like in a small group, and begin to pray the rosary together, we generate our own belief sphere, and miracles become possible. All kinds of things become possible. You can read about all our miracles on our way of the rose.org. We've tried trying to keep them all updated. It's very hard because so hard. many people have them. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and it becomes a kind of joke among people who start because when, when you start to share them as, Every, everybody's got them everybody's got them yep and then they're more come yeah the more people share their miracle stories the more they come and this is that the generating of that belief sphere you once you once that you you enter into a space where miracles are possible miracles happen hmm. So beautiful. And I love your website and you have a Facebook group as well and I'm gonna um We've been talking for almost an hour and a half, which I could talk to you guys all day. I mean, here's the thing. We've never even, I just, I have so much I want to talk to you. Oh, it's the... she, she froze. Froze. I think I'm freezing. Did I freeze? Am you I freeze back? Over a bit. back. <laughs> did I come back? back. Mm -hmm. I back. did freeze. Well, anyways, I was just saying, I hope you come back next year in 2021 oh, so we can keep talking because I just, it, it's just such a gift. It was such a gift. And what you do is such a gift. And I want to give space for some parting last words from all three of you. But I also would love for you, it's in the show notes, but if you want to share um, the website again and your Facebook group so that folks who want to connect in can, and then let's do some parting words of wisdom. Well, our website is wayoftherose.org, and you can find out, read our ladies' messages there. Uh, you can read about how to pray the rosary. You can read about all of our many, many Zoom and phone meetings and activities that exist in our group. And, uh, and in general, just, you know, uh, participate in this very, very vibrant and vital community. And we've written The Way of the Rose is our book about the rosary. And 
in deep time and for climate change and Clark's poems that got recited are now is the hour for return. They're all available online and there are links to them on the website. And our Facebook group is filled with people who just want to celebrate and love the lady in the earth by any name you want to call her. And, that, and it is, it could not be more inclusive and friendly. And it's one of the nicest places ever. Um, and, and it's called the way of the rose. The way of the rose. And we'd Just love to have it. you join us, pray with us, bring miracles in. And thank you, Lisa, for bringing the dead into the world and bring their voices to us all. And thank you, April, for listening to beloved Santa Muerta. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you. I feel such a honor and honor. Well, all of you are such dear, dear people to me and to everyone out there in the community. I just love all of you so much. It's been such a beautiful year. Um, I will share my my triple goddess energy after um, we had our last podcast together. Um, I finished um, just reading the very last section back here of all the messages directly from Our Lady and Oh my God, just, just the, the talking about spiral time and trajectories and uh, she just filled me up. And, and so I painted this painting. So this woman here, this moon goddess on this side oh, here, came through um, just, I'm not even a painter, but she came through me after I completed the book and that she's, she's got three different pieces of hair for the maiden, the mother and the crone. So I love that you shared that today. It makes me so joyful. Um, so thank you for that. And um, we have one more show this year, everybody. It is um, on December 16th, myself and five other mediums are getting together with 2021 predictions. It's gonna be so much fun. We have such great information coming through for everyone. So. Do not miss that. It's going to be beautiful. Um, and and that's kind of it. And you can go back and watch Perdita and Clark on their first episode with us. It was earlier this year. I think it's called Mary's Messages of Love. And I just love all of you. I feel like this was just so auspicious today with this incredible full moon and eclipse and every other thing. Thank you so much for having us on. Oh, I would you. want to hug you both to bits. <laughs> but you couldn't, oh, hug, you, you couldn't hug them anyway. I even know. It's just making me crazy. Hugging anymore. It's making me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. It's like a big group hug in here. And thank you again to everybody who's watching. Please, please, please join us. I did join Facebook again. I'm back on Facebook. I was off this entire year in protest of their censorship but i am back so we can continue to spread the light everywhere so you can find buddhist biohacker on there and i'll be um rejoining the way of the rose i missed being part of that group leaving facebook so i'm happy to be back on for that oh and wonderful we have a lot of people who are on facebook only for way of the rose they tell us That's right. we That's right. it's, a, it's a great the thing that it allows us to do unlike any of the other platforms is to have really in-depth conversations with people. Yeah. And that's what it's for, is for dialogue and conversation. Yeah, building friendships. And yeah. making real life friends. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was reminded that, um, you know, we have to bring our light to every platform. And yeah, you know, exactly. So yeah. I'm back. So you guys can find Buddhist Biohacker on all the platforms if you'd like. And I'm trying to get on Instagram. I'm trying to do it. <laughs> Speaks are so powerful. Oh, I'm freezing. I think I'm freezing. But you're not, no. you're not. Oh, okay, good. Um, but we have just powerful, powerful times coming up through the end of the year. So um, stay close, everybody, to your rosary.